Hey, how's it going, guys? So we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, so this week we're talking about totalitarian regimes and political leaders kind of taking control of things. And I wanted to connect something that's a little bit more of a modern um, history moment into something that was happening back in the 1920s and 1930s. In addition, I also wanted to kind of um, segue into your lesson number one next week when we jump into World War II. So I thought I would get the guitar out and I would play you guys the intro to a song of which you'll find the answer to next week. Now, in the comments of this video, I want you guys to comment the band of the song I'm getting ready to play. And of course, my dog just came in, I guess, to check out and see what was happening. But anyways, um, I'm going to play the intro to the song with my guitar, and then you guys can comment um, what you think, who, like the band that played the song, and then I'll also give you guys a little bit of history um, about the band, so it kind of give you guys some hints if you don't recognize the music. So the band that played uh, this song came out in 1993. It was an Irish band. And some things were kind of going on in 1993 that was some political um, issues between Northern Ireland um, and places in the UK where they were having political troubles and bombs and stuff were going off. And so this uh, band had wrote a song because they were kind of anti-war, they were anti like, you know, shifts of um, political views and all that kind of stuff and so they wrote a song to kind of um, decorate what it was like for the common people going through a country with political turmoil and or war. And so I thought this was kind of um, deserving because we are studying four countries that are going through political shifts and um, not everyone in the countries agree. So if you were a communist in Russia, they were definitely anti-communist. If you were a Nazi in Germany, they were definitely anti-Nazis. And in the modern view of 1993 in Northern Ireland, they were Republicans and anti-Republicans and violence and stuff breaks out. So again, in the comments of the video, go ahead and we'll see if you guys can, this is a little bit of music history, if you guys can recognize the name of the band is one and if you can maybe you know the name of the song now I know a lot of you guys are gonna go out on the internet and do some research and try to figure out the song I get it hopefully you guys maybe have heard it from your parents anyways so here's how the song goes in make sure I'm plugged in so intro is And then it goes into the next part of the song and it gets pretty hard rock. So but we're not going to play that part because my kids are trying to sleep. <laughs> anyway, so again, that's the intro to the song. Lesson one next week going to World War II. We'll be doing a little music video and lyric study um, to see if we can identify views of um, anti-totalitarianism, anti-war, and all of the above. So that's kind of a hint of next week of a lesson that we're going to have. And of course in this video, if you guys can comment the name of the band and or the name of the song that I just played. So go ahead and hope you guys like this. If you want more things, a little bit of music, we can add music in for the rest of the year. Just let me know. All right. Just let you guys know that this video is most likely sponsored by Jif Peanut Butter. Um, I got a lot of food sponsors, so you guys got to watch every video I post on here because I got to just tell you all my food sponsors. Today's Jif. It's only the creamy peanut butter. If you like crunchy, I'm sorry. I creamy's creamy's all they got. This is good stuff. Look, not even open. They just sent this to me. Amazon primed overnighted it just for the video. So if you guys are hungry, order up some groceries, sneak in, get some Jif peanut butter. Don't get, any, don't get anything else other than Jif. Anyways, to the lesson. Hey, let's go ahead and just do a little screen share. We're going to look at totalitarian regimes, 
say that three times fast. Anyways, here we go. So we have communist Russia, we have fascist Italy and Nazis of Germany. By the way, just let you guys know, if you're a Nazi or you're a fascist, you're both just fascist. They just had to give Germany a different name because of the racism and the Holocaust. Um, the Italians weren't like whole, like, like let's eliminate an entire race of people. But technically they are both fascist countries. Um, we'll kind of get into what that means. Our goal today is you guys are gonna analyze, that means break it down, the rise of these different governments. Hopefully by the time that you watch this, you already did lesson one, and you kind of already know a little bit about the four main countries. These are the European ones. Don't forget we also have Japan. Plus how much, how much faster can I talk, right? All right, totalitarianism, AKA guys, it's a dictatorship. This is not much different than, um, if you remember back in feudalism, we had kings. It's no different. It's one supreme ruler ruling all the country. Here's the difference. In feudalism, kings broke it down between barons and lords, lesser lords and knights. And that's kind of how they distributed power and also wealth. With a dictatorship, it's not exactly the case. It's one person who has advisors or a, a secretary or someone who's heading a, bure, a, a, you know, a bureaucratic department. Um, and so that's kind of how they run their country. So it's kind of more on one person's shoulders than anything. Anyways, definition. It's a government that establishes complete control. It's highly nationalistic, meaning my country's better than yours. Like my ethnicity, my country, my flag, my colors, my military, numero uno, which is kind of weird because when you see Germany and Italy have that alliance together, how do two countries who are totalitarians and have nationalism and believe that they're number one can work together? Kind of interesting. Um, strict controls and laws. Way more laws than there are privileges. Reasons why? How are you going to stay in power? You have to restrict people. Now remember, we've gone from no democratic rights, a breakdown of feudalism, to more than enough rights for anyone to have. All right, we're past the enlightenment. This is a backtrack. All right, this is essentially trying to go backwards to feudalism. Military state, they have a secret police. So on the assessment, if you wanna be a police officer that enforces the rule, this is where you come in. Um, they use censorship that restricts literature, ideas, um, because they don't want anyone, more or less, think about the press for a second, newspapers, you know, anti-totalitarian newspapers. They don't want that. That's also where we get propaganda. They get to choose the media. They get to choose the radio, what's written in the newspapers, what posters are approved. It's kind of like on school. You can't put a poster for your club until you first get approved by administration. So it's kind of similar to that. Other than if you said something anti-administration, they're not, you know, going to execute you. You're just going to get disciplined. Um, again, very much a one leader dictatorship. You have to have a quality of what we call charismatic, you need to be a good speaker. Um, although Hitler had some messed up ideas, the guy ran his country extremely efficient. If you look at, statistically, he was a great leader. He did a, a lot of, he accomplished a lot of his goals, a lot of his plans. He was a wonderful speaker. He knew what the people wanted. He told them what they wanted. They voted for him and then he did what he wanted. And then they were kind of just stuck with him because guess what? When you give up your rights of voting, and you can't vote for politicians, or I don't know, if you don't even show up to vote for politicians, guess what? You just get what they give them. If you like Peter Pan peanut butter, and all you get is Jif, guess what you eat? You eat Jif. So you gotta go out and vote, you gotta go and choose. So when you guys turn 18, make sure you register. All right, again, total conformity of people to ideas and leader. So last thing, terror and fear. Um, the best way to make people controlled is you make an example of somebody. Someone speaks against the government, they take them out, they execute them in public, kill them on the spot, leave their blood, and they put posters everywhere, letting you know that you will be like so-and-so if you keep speaking anti-political things. Now, I hope someone, and I know someone, is probably thinking, wait a minute, Mr. Vance, in the French Revolution, they got democracy, but they were guillotining and chopping off people's heads because they spoke against the government. Right, that is also terror and fear, but remember, they were doing terror and fear in the regards to get democracy. So they were more or less cutting the heads off of people who were anti-democratic. This is, we're gonna flip the coin. 
Now it's we're killing people who are anti-dictator. So it's the same process, same terror, same fear, but they're trying to get it for a different type of means. And again, in the song that I played you guys, it's a little tricky. When next week when we look at the lyrics um, and we listen to the song, it's almost like, wait, are they anti-war or are they anti-political violence? Because those are two different things. War and political violence are two different things because you, you're trying to get two different things. You're not trying to control another country. You're trying to control your own country. Um, so it's interesting. All right, here we go. After World War I, there's a lot of destruction. We're talking about 8 million people dead. Lots of destruction. We can see here this is probably a cathedral, which was built probably in medieval times. Finding jobs for veterans was an important thing. Rebuilding cities was important. Again, I'm just going to scroll through here pretty fast. I did most of the talking already. We can see soldiers down here. Don't forget that there's a Great Depression going on. After World War I, um, let's talk about the United States for a second. In the 1920s, the United States was in a boom period. Um, people made a lot of money, their incomes increased, uh, livelihoods increased, everything was going good. Again, they call it the Roaring Twenties. If you've ever heard of the book or seen the movie The Great Gatsby, that the, that's the 1920s, all right? Um, so a lot of great things are happening, but 1929, guess what? Stock market crash. Everything falls apart, we go into a Great Depression. We call it the 1930s. Um, this is a famous photo right here. This is actually, this is a mom, she's in Oklahoma. Oklahoma was hit by more than just the Great Depression, but also hit with um, a dust bowl. So they had a horrible drought. Um, eight inches of all their topsoil was taken away by wind um, and they lost everything. As you can see, their kids all have these bobs, short haircuts. A lot of that had to do with management, it's hot. So a shorter haircut means you can cool off faster. Um, and then also just um, for hygiene purposes as well. But you can just kind of see like the despair in her face. She doesn't exactly know what she's gonna do, how she's gonna get by. Um, in a di dictatorship, um, they take control and they radically transform society. Um, this shows you an example of how the environment can take toll on somebody, but this is also the same kind of facial features you're gonna get of people who are being controlled in a dictatorship as well. Again, here's a map, the effect of Great Depression. So in this map, um, you can kind of see who has the largest toll. We have Great Britain and we have Germany. When you say, okay, how did Hitler rise to power, Mr. Mance? Look at the bar graph. That's why. A lot of issues. Now, I'm sure if you guys remember, if you read a little bit up in the Treaty of Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles had one main goal, punish Germany. Now, if you punish somebody so badly, that's going to come back with bad effects. So that's where we get these individuals. We have Joseph Stalin. He's a communist, which is the idea that the um, government or the state owns all public property and even most private property. And they distribute it, distribute it out to the people or like a commune or a community shares everything that's communism if you look at some of the basis of communism it's actually a very attractive it looks oh we all just share everything so if i grow a bunch of corn and my neighbor grows a bunch of pigs then we just kind of share back and forth and we have a great community that's the basis but that's also a utopian society you have to eliminate the rights of property in order to get that it's like hey you have to share your products but well, i don't want to share my products you have to but I don't want to share my Jif peanut butter. I want to keep all my Jif peanut butter. No, you got to divide it out, give everybody a spoonful. Imagine if we were in class and you brought five Oreo cookies. Mr. Vance, can I eat my Oreo cookies? Yes, as long as everybody gets a bite of your Oreo cookies. Now we're all going to get a bite of Oreo cookies, but here's the thing, we may not all be satisfied because we had such a small little bite. Now in reverse, let's say that we have a five gallon bucket full of Oreos. We're all gonna be satisfied if we divide that out and share it. But that's not technically, that's what we call healthy communism versus unhealthy. When you look at Mussolini and Hitler, they had a type of government that's called fascism. It's a little bit like communism, except in the idea that people can still own private property. However, that private property is under the laws of the state. So for instance, if, a fascist country wanting to come in and take your bakery 
and use all the bread to feed their police force, they have a right to. Whereas in America, they cannot do that. They have to have a search warrant or they have to have some kind of a legal means of taking over your business. In communism, they don't take over your business. They either shut your business down because you're not operating correctly or they just take it over and then distribute the wealth in that manner. It's a little bit different. They're both very controlling as far as governments go. All right, rise of fascism in Italy starts with a guy named Mussolini. He takes control in 1919, which by the way, I'm not sure if you guys understand, that's the last year of World War I. That's when he starts his fascist party, but he doesn't quite take control. Um, he pledges to make Italy a great country. Again, that is nationalism. Notice the words here, Roman Empire. Roman Empire is one of the best empires ever in world history. We studied it. We know this. That's what he wants to return Italy to. Um, so again, that's nationalism. They um, Typically, if you see a fascist, you'll see this word black shirts. Uh, the other day, um, two of my kids, they came out wearing black pants and bl long sleeve black shirts. And I was like, fascism. That's the first thing that hit my head because that's what fascists typically wore. Um, whenever they started their parties in countries. They, so a lot of times they get the names black shirts. Um, again, fascism, intense nationalism, my state's better than yours, totalitarian control. The state is more important than the individual. That's what gives them the right to take over your bakery. However, we're gonna let you own your bakery, but if we need it, we're gonna take it away. Maintain class system and private ownership. That's the main difference of communism. Now, fascism enemies of communism so they don't like each other communist fascists don't like each other so that means germany italy are both fascist countries russia a communist country different ideologies both dictatorships different ideologies they don't quite like each other um again you should have already studied this treaty of versailles a lot of issues with germany hyperinflation is where like the prices rise super super fast they also lost territory. They lost territory that was given to create a country called Poland. And they also were, um, had territory that was taken away and given to France. If you guys remember, Germany was in France at the closure of the war. So how in the world does France take property away from Germany, right? It's not right, it's unfair. And justly, it was unfair to Germany and it will lead to their issues. I think we've seen this before, right? The guillotine. Um, here's um, Adolf Hitler, a little bit of background. Um, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf. He wrote it when he was in prison. He did get put in prison in Germany um, because of political rallies and violence. Um, and his struggle all had to do with the ideas that um, Germany was falling apart, he could fix it, and the Jews were all to blame for every problem that existed in Germany. So you see a lot of the racist views and ideologies come up in this book as well. Um, again, Nazism is just a different type of fascism. Uh, we have communism. Um, we have a guy named um, Lenin who transforms Russia into a communist state. But more importantly, it's going to be Joseph Stalin who is going to be the one who makes it happen and he actually runs the actual country. Now remember, Joseph Stalin is going to be working with the United States at the closure of World War II. So when I ask you who took over Germany, it's the United States and Russia together. So we have a democratic and a communist country. And of course, the Cold War is all about communism, capitalism in America, and those tensions that occur there. <sighs> Moving through propaganda. So if you look at this picture, you would think Joseph Stalin was a wonderful person. Everyone's bringing him flowers. He looks like a gentle soul, nothing to fear, right? Here's Hitler, you can see him. He's gonna lead the country to greatness. Here's Stalin. He's going to lead his country into a military might, to make the biggest state. Again, that's all nationalism. Here is Mussolini. Notice he's standing on a box. Mussolini was like five foot two. He was a very short individual. Um, so like, for instance, I'm six foot. So imagine a five foot two like leader, right? But he stood on a box and people loved him. But he had a, he was very charismatic. He was a good speaker. Here's a good picture. Um, this is the Nazi rally. Um, that's a lot of freaking people. That's a lot of people. 
So in the, in the 1920s and 30s, if you saw this, you would probably think, that's a little scary. That's a lot of people coming together for one idea. Um, again, he, I will post this. This is a good, um, good one right here that you guys can look at. It gives you key characteristics of each one of communism, fascism, and Nazism. You don't necessarily have to know the differences. You just need to know that they're all dictatorships. All right, so I think that's pretty much time that we have. I just wanna make sure you guys were aware of what um, these three things were, the communism and fascism and Nazism. So um, again, we're gonna segue over here into some more music and then do a little outro. So don't forget to comment if you know what the song was. And if you have any questions at all about any of this stuff, go ahead, answer in the comments, and I will answer your question. All right, that's it. We're going to go ahead and stop the share here. And don't forget that if you get hungry and you got jelly and bread, match it up with some Jif peanut butter. I get paid nothing to say this because they actually aren't really sponsoring me. But it would be kind of cool if they were, right? Peanut butter sponsor for teachers. Hey, you can dream, right? All right, we'll see you in the next segment. All right, guys. So that's the video for this week. I hope that helped answer some questions, identify some things. Again, if you have questions, leave them in the comments. I'll answer them. Um, I hope everything's working kind of good with all the lessons. Again, just two lessons this week. And remember, lesson two is super, super important because it's going to help you with the assessment. Next week, we jump into World War II. Don't forget, we're going to start World War II off with a music video lesson. We're going to go back to the 1990s, a little bit of music history. And we're going to compare some modern events to old school events. So, hope you guys like the video. And this is all for this one. Don't forget to watch the outros. And again, like, comment, and I'll see you guys next time.